All right, how's everybody doing today? All right, everybody full of food? All right, everybody hear us okay? No. Cool, awesome. All right, so hopefully you're here for um, basically a full stack cash dive. Um, this is a two hour lab, so this is a very hands on event. Uh, we're going to be handing out USB sticks. If you don't have a USB port in your computer, um, let us know. We have DVDs as well. Hopefully, you have a DVD drive. Uh, we've done this talk, I think, now three times or so. Um, so this is supposed to be very interactive. We want you guys to ask questions. We want you guys to interrupt us. We want you to do, you know, if you have questions, raise your hand. One of us will come out um, and, and try to work with you. We broke this up into three different sections. Um, I'm basically going to start uh, by doing a basic introduction of what we're, what we're talking about. Um, uh, also, I'm Jason Ford, CTO of Black Mesh. Um, Campbell uh, is with um, Form 1. And uh, Ernest is with uh, The Economist. So between the three of us, um, I'm going to basically get your machine, get a virtual machine up on your machine, on your laptop. Um, if you don't want to do that, that's OK. You can follow around along on the screen with us. Um, and then from there, uh, Campbell, I think, is going to go second with, the, uh, with basically the diving into some varnish stuff um, and talking about how to make a, the site on this, this VM that we give you uh, run faster. Uh, so you're going to be actively working inside this VM and hopefully breaking it um, and then fixing it. Uh, and there's going to be certain things that you're not probably going to understand, which is good. That's what we want to have to happen, and we're going to help you get through those. Um, and then on the last part, uh, we're basically going to go into a really deep dive on different uh, methods and styles of how to troubleshoot uh, different caching problems you may have. Uh, maybe a site's taking, it's not caching at all, or maybe it's taking too long to load or something like, like that. Mm -hmm. So we've structured this so that we can adapt depending on the, uh, the knowledge level that you guys have going into this. So the only way that works is if you are brave enough to raise your hands and let us know when we say something that makes no sense or something that, does that mean that makes no sense? Oh, no, you're just fixing your hair. <laughs> but good, I like the way you're working. So this is going to be very helpful for us. Um, yeah, so the, that's the only way it works. Part halfway through, we're going to take a, we're going to take a little breather so everyone can get up and, and move around and wake up a little bit. Um, and yeah, please do talk back and let us know what you understand and what you don't. All right. So uh, right now, you uh, yep, I'm back. Yeah. So I'm on these USBs and these DVDs that are being handed out right now. Um, I'm actually going to go through that process on my slide on how to get that VM off of there. There is VirtualBox installers for Windows and OS X on there. Um, if you're running Linux, then um, the problem is there's 14 different Linux versions for VirtualBox. So just go and Google VirtualBox and go download the right one for you. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't fit them all onto there because it's, it's just a lot of stuff. So uh, anybody, any other questions before we get started? Yes. Yes. Three. Yeah, three. Yep. Good question. Yes, excellent question. All right, cool. Uh, all right, so to get started, um, like I said, Campbell, Ernest, and I um, kind of just give our contact information. Um, feel free to email us after this if you wish. Find us, seek us out. We're running around. Um, you know, we are happy to answer questions. If you have problems, if I don't know the answer, if Campbell doesn't know the answer, or if Ernest doesn't know the answer, we probably know someone who does. So, and we're always intrigued to find new things that are out there that we haven't seen before as well. So, just a quick survey in the room: Who here has done varnish or any kind of caching stuff? Awesome. awesome. That is what I was hoping. How many of you have played with Vickle, uh, uh, VCL stuff? before understand fetch and stuff like that awesome good good awesome how many people have set up apc memcached awesome this i'm very better. happy this is much better than the last one we did <laughs> <laughs> it was like three people out of 150 raised their hand we we're like oh that's not good <laughs> so um kind of go over some of the architectures the kind of the overview um, we're gonna go over some of the architecture stuff that we have inside of this and why we designed it this way um, we try to, to mimic a production stack of things that we see on a regular basis uh, and try to mirror that as best we can into a local environment uh, kind of go over some of the overview of those technologies each of those things whether it's Apache or why we use Apache or why, why we would use nginx or um, why you'd use varnish over something else or what, you know, those, those different choices you need to make in those different processes. And some of the experiences that we've, you know, all three of us have hit um, throughout these years with playing with this stuff. Um, then we're going to basically install this virtual instance uh, locally on your machine. 
And then from there, it's it's basically going to be cash, cash, cash is what we're going to do. We're going to try to break some stuff, make some things fixed, um, take stuff that's loading in, in really long times, minute plus load times, down to instantaneously loading. Um, basically building some basic vehicles, some troubleshooting you know, techniques, things that you you may or may not may have not done or thought about, um, how to um, how to basically uh, uh, pull those things together. Um, if you don't get a USB or a DVD, um, we've given out all the USBs, so ask your neighbor for one or raise your hand if you don't have one, and Dan will find you. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> I knew 100 wasn't enough. <laughs> so if you can just pass them. Just pass them down. Cool. Cool. Just make sure you share. We are a friendly community. Please share. Um, yeah, and some basic varnish examples and, and basic troubleshooting. Um, make sure you copy all the files off those those uh, USB sticks. There are some samples on there as well that we've kind of used and it's just as a starting place. So um, kind of get over some of this. is going to be repetitive for some of you. Um, uh, so kind of the full stack of Drupal, right? So different ways of caching, uh, different, different levels, and you want to do caching in layers. So a lot of times what you'll find yourself using is either an Akamai or a Limelight or a Max CDN or something along those lines as being your front front end line of defense against large spikes of traffic. So those things can protect you from getting DDoSed even um, if someone's trying to be malicious on your site or you know just trying to get out to uh, closer to your user base. So executing things like CloudFront from Amazon or using Max CDN, which are pretty cost effective solutions, um, or if you need something that's a little more enterprise level, you can go with a Limelight or an Akamai or something like that, but you pay for those services. But it does protect you, right? So it gives you that first line of defense against not only security, but also against other things that uh, traffic spikes that are hitting you. So the next level down from that typically in an architecture is um, some kind of SSL offload because at the end of the day, Varnish doesn't speak SSL. Um, so you have to get it out of, out of talking SSL encrypted stuff. So how do you do that, right? So there's about six different ways or three different ways to do that. Um, one way is using pound. Um, that was kind of the old school way of most people doing it. You can use an actual hardware load balancer, whether that's a Kemp Technologies or an F5 or something like that if you have the ability to buy those things. Most of the time we don't because we're in a cloud environment, so you have to make do with what you got. Um, HA Proxy's uh, latest rev version in dev actually has SSL support in it now. So if you're HA Proxy aware and you know how to configure those things, you can offload there. Um, you can use an Apache proxy or an Nginx proxy in front, which is a pretty popular way of doing it as well. Um, something to get SSL offloaded, right? Because SSL will not ever be cached um, for anything you're doing. Once it comes out of that proxy or that, that setting, you're basically going to drop it into some, mostly a, a load balancing technology, whether it's Varnish you're using that as, uh, as a load balancer or Nginx or IPVS and a kernel or... Um, HA proxy again, you could have multiple layers or do it all in one layer. And then Varnish is a cache layer itself. Yep. Is the DVD supposed to have VirtualBoxes for Linux too? It does not. Yeah, like I said, I, I couldn't, there's 14 different versions of VirtualBox for Linux, depending upon your kernel version and your OS. So just download it. Hopefully the Wi Fi will hold out. Um, it's not huge, it's like 100 megs. So, uh, so yep. It is. That is just a VirtualBox program install. If you, yeah, no, no, no. That's that's inside. We'll we'll get to that in a second. It's There's on, also it's a virtual slides. machine on that on there that is. disk, but there it's is. in the, it's not in the same folder. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yep. yep. So yep. Yes. Yeah, sadly, it's four gigs in size or two gigs in size. So it's a little, I didn't want to kill the Wi-Fi, which we all know DrupalCon Wi-Fi is sometimes rough. So um, by the time I get to the slides, you should be able to have a USB and a DVD in your hand, would be my guess. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the next level, you know, is basically varnishes, as you know already today with all the hands that are up. You know, you, kind of, you guys sort of know about that already, and we're going to dive into that pretty heavily today. And then web server technology, you know, whether it's Apache, Nginx, Lighty, depending upon what you're actually doing, right? So... There's a holy war that could be waged between Apache and Nginx. You know, everybody has one, sort of like Emacs and VI. You know, which one do you use and how do you use those things? Um, it's, it's your choice. You know, there's not really a lot of differences between the two except for memory footprint. Um, and if you're in smaller VMs and things of that nature in Amazon you have to deal with, then Nginx makes sense, right? But you're loading PHP outside of, 
outside the program and calling it separately. Whereas Apache with Mod PHP, you're you're calling it inside those children and making it shorter and larger. So um, just a little more efficient. In, in our opinion, it's Apache is more efficient than Nginx from the perspective of just ease of use and, and configurability. Um, but again, you have to deal with what you got. So um, high availability solutions, kind of went over that already. You know, basically you can have multiple multiple things horizontally scaled in these solutions. Whether you're doing the offload, um, and you can use Heartbeat or something between those. Um, you know, same thing in the varnish layers. You can load balance, load balance varnish. Same thing in the, the Apache side. You just have to make sure persistence is set in some cases because, you know, when you log into Drupal, it sets certain things, and you want to make sure those things get carried down to the right web head. Um, again, cache on layers is the biggest, biggest message we need to say here. Anybody have any questions so far? Good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to make these available afterwards. Yeah. So, kind of the lab stack I'm, we're giving you on this on this uh, medium that we're handing out right now. So, obviously, you need your laptop. That's number one thing. Can't do. Can't use iPads. Can't use. Someone actually said in Prague, like he showed me a Windows 95 box and said, "Can you install VirtualBox on this?" And like, no. <laughs> Please no. Um, if you have 32-bit operating system installed, this will also not work. It is a 64-bit VM, so that's that's another another problem. Um, the installer for VirtualBox is on that on that uh, on that medium. So um, basically, if you haven't installed it yet or you don't have it, please install it, um, and I'll get to that in a few slides. Uh, it is CentOS 6 6.5 64-bit um, Varnish, of course, is why we're here. APC, uh, Memcache, MySQL. So. So, yeah. So varnish is is just the first level of defense, right? And if you're not using CDM, which most people don't, that's going to be your first level. There's lots of things varnish can do for you besides caching. You can put mod security rules inside varnish, where you can actually do um, host uh, basically IDP rules to filter out people from doing cross-site scripting hacks, SQL injection, things of that nature. If you have that problem, I highly encourage you to go look at those things. Um, those vickles are out there. They're in the wild. They're on GitHub. Um, they're very useful, um, especially if you're trying to do some kind of PCI compliance where you need a WAF, uh, Web Application Firewall. It can actually meet those those needs. So Varnish is a is a really useful tool, right? It's universal as well. Um, Ernest is going to go over some stuff using you know some conceptual knowledge of how Varnish can be used in ways that you wouldn't think of, um, and that's kind of the, the the good part of this is that each of us have have kind of a, a different a different perspective on how these things work and how they work together. So Apache for us, um, in this case, just because that's what we're familiar with, that's what we work with a lot, um, we don't have memory limitations. So, you know, Nginx is really, like I said, is, is whenever you have limited memory to deal with and you want to have concurrency hit, um, you know, you can typically, you know, typically hit more concurrency on Nginx, but that's what horizontal scaling is for in load balancing if you need to go more. Wait a minute. Nobody put up their hands for the fact that we're using Apache and not Nginx? I like this. Is there nobody who wants to argue this? Let's hear, let's let's hear, hear your argument. Give them, give, give them hell. <laughs> what's, what's the reason you'd use Nginx over Apache? Well, right now, I'm having terrible performance issues with Apache, so I don't think Nginx is the way to go. Okay. So the, the, the statement was, I'm having horrible, horrible performance issues out of uh, Apache, so Nginx is the way to go. Um, so that, that is, uh, in a lot of cases, there's, there's situations where, like I said, you're memory starved. So Apache is the problem, right? So if you're trying to do, um, you know, whenever you're cho Apache children and go to 256 megs of memory, and now you have 15 or 20 of them running around, you know, that, that chews up a lot of space, right? And that's, that's an issue. If you're using Nginx, uh, you know, with, with the fast CGI side, um, or FPM, um, basically you can, you can limit those things from happening. However, typically it's not usually Apache's fault. It's usually something else that is causing it. Usually it's PHP. Um, or it is something else that's outside that's impacting it. Apache at the end of the day is just a web server. So it does it's just doing what it's told to do. Um, so the biggest thing is is go, you know, what I would suggest is make sure you go and look at logs and figuring out what is making Apache do that or what Nginx is doing that. Um, generally you're not, you know, most of the time just switching them out is not going to solve the issue. Sometimes mm -hmm. it does. 
the biggest use of, use of memory is going to be coming from the PHP application in the first place. And whether you're loading that from, from uh, Apache or you're loading that from Nginx, you're loading the same library and you're interpreting the same script. Um, a high, high memory usage script like Drupal 7 under certain configurations is going to be high memory usage under Nginx, Apache, Lighty, whatever you want. Yep. Got another one. And that's definitely, that's definitely a really valid reason to pick. So the, the comment was that in his particular shop, they use Nginx partly because, of, uh, because they find the configuration management a lot easier for their administrative overhead. They are more comfortable with it. All the configuration is in the same place. Um, that is totally valid, and those are good reasons to use Nginx. I would say in defense of Apache that uh, you can get great performance gains if you take everything out of HD access, disable HD access reading, and dump, them, dump all those rules into a configuration file, the same way you have to do with, uh, Nginx. with Nginx. Yep. But in the end, the most important thing is you should use the tool that you're most comfortable with. Right, exactly. And that's, you know, it, most of our cases, we're running into situations where we've, we're given what we're given, and that's what the developers like or something along those lines. So, you know, you have to choose the tool that you, you know how to use, and you also have to use the tool that you know, right? If you don't know something, uh, you don't know how to use that tool, and you know, how, you know how to make something else scale, then by all means, use that. Not everything is a nail, but a lot of things can be nails <laughs> if you're good with a hammer. Exactly. So um, with PHP, you know, this is uh, 5.3, and I'll say this out loud here as it gets on recording, is 5.3 is now, I believe, end of life. So 5.4 um, and 5.5 are kind of the, the, the way to go these days. 5.2 is definitely end of life. It's been that way for a while. So from a security perspective, you know, if you guys have 5.3 out there, start looking at ways of getting 5.4 in your environments. Um, that's my security hat. Sorry. Um, so in this case, we are using 5.3. Um, sorry to say that. Um, but uh, we have an APC uh, as a cache level as well for PHP. Who, who here has dealt with APC in the past? Awesome, awesome, good, good. Other than, have you ever used it other than using it for PHP bytecode compiling? It is, it's, a, it's a caching, it's a binary cache, yeah, object cache. Any issue with APC and 5.4? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Question was, is there an issue with APC and 5.4? Not that, not that I'm aware of. We, I mean, we're running in certain sites, so. Okay. Yep. In the back. That's true. Five five, I know, is definitely has an issue. It. Hmm. Yeah, it's been basically the code from APC is moved to uh, to opcache. It does the same thing and works in very, very nearly identically the same way. And in fact, as far as Drupal users are, are concerned, it is totally identical and swap out. But that's that's actually a very good point. Is that true for configuration options as well? Uh, the com you mean like in your APC.ini file? I think so. Yeah. At least the ones at least the ones that I use. There may be some some uh, really in depth stuff that's changed, but. Yeah, I think the shared memory stuff and all that stuff is still the same time to live. The important bits yeah. that we're always changing. What about the uh, file uploads? The question was, what about what about progress in file uploads? Um, uh, that I don't think is actually related. It works. I, I haven't seen any issue with it anyway. Yeah. All right. So. Um, Continuing on, so we use memcache for this. We certainly could use Redis, um, but memcache in this particular session, in, in this case, um, mainly because we didn't have time to put Redis into this. Um, but you can certainly use that. Um, they have, each of them have their strengths. Um, Redis is a, a little bit faster. I, I, I think it's a little less complex. Um, but at the same time, you know, memcache is kind of tried, true, and tested. Um, so if you're familiar with one over the other, you know, again, choose the right tool for the right thing. 
Um, MySQL is on this, on this particular uh, piece for us. You can certainly use MariaDB. Um, they're pretty much interchangeable. So uh, we've used them both. Uh, they both have their strengths, again, and their weaknesses. MariaDB has a lot of the enterprise features that MySQL you don't get unless you buy enterprise. So if you're looking for those particular features, which are pretty slim, most people don't need them, um, it is there. InnoDB performance is a little bit higher in Maria, um, in, in, in our test cases anyway. So again, it is use what you, the, the performance increase isn't enough to make you want to just rip it out and replace it. Um, and that's, that's kind of the point we're trying to get here is that get the low hanging fruit, find the stuff that you can, you can take out easily and then replace those, those pieces or configure those pieces. Um, yeah, kind of went over most of this already. Yep. Did I get an error unzipping the varnish file? Is anybody else having that? Uh-oh. If everybody has an error unzipping the varnish file, this is going to be a very tricky session. <laughs> I'm going to be uploading that to a Dropbox, and we're all going to crush the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you have Linux. So I zipped it on a Mac, so if that's, if that's a problem... Yeah, use unzip. My unzip just finished. I was testing it a second. It worked. Okay, cool. So use unzip for Linux people. Awesome. So uh, Connery went with the memcache Redis key store idea. Um, just more optimization things more than anything else. If you're not using a module, don't use it. Turn it off. Delete it. Kill it with fire. Um, just remove it. The, if you're not using a module in Drupal, turn it off. Um, the, the bigger part is is that if you don't turn it off, then that's just more stuff that PHP is going to have to do, and you know you have more hooks to call, and causes more overhead, and just causes all kinds of pain and suffering when you try to do upgrades, and things can break and white screen, and you won't know why. It so, seems like a really minor thing to to uncheck that little module box, but it makes it actually can make an enormous difference. Is that a question over there? Oh, I always forget which one is which. The question is, do we have a preference for the Peckle uh, memcache modules, memcache storage versus memcache? Do you have a preference? I, well, I, I can never remember. One of them is the maintained Peckle. better, yeah, but I, I never remember the which. Module. I mean, we, we usually just use the Peckle module, and that's, that's it. Yeah. Was, oh. At the Drupal level, that's you. At the Drupal level, if there is if there's a separate memcache storage module, I I have never heard of it before, but I will look at it right now and get back to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, again, this is a lab, so we're learning too, as as everyone is. So there's certain things that you know, you can only be exposed to so much. So. Everybody has a different experience, and that's the cool part about these labs that we've done in the past is everybody has something that's different, so that's why we want you to speak up. So back in the back. I'm sorry. You're going to have to use either a microphone or, or just talk a lot louder. So the comment was uh, that he thinks uh, cache router is not being maintained right now, and that the memcache module is the one that's being maintained. Yeah, uh, cache router 6x. Okay, so that's definitely out. Okay, cache well, router is 6x. Sorry, but is, is it being maintained for six? Uh, minimally maintained. Okay, a lot of cache router ended up in core for seven. So. Um, God help you if you're still using Drupal 6, but if you are, please use Pressflow. Um, please, for the love of God, use Pressflow um, because Varnish isn't supported in D6 by default. So if you have a D6 site, upgrade it is my biggest thing. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people are still running D5. Um, there's a lot of it out there, unfortunately. So um, just try to use the tools that are out there to, to kind of make things scale. D6 was a great first effort. Press flow is even a better effort. D7 is even better. I'm sure D8 will be the same way. Um, get search out of, you know, search will kill you, um, as you probably already know. Um, just more of a, a point of optimization. Use solar. Get it outside. Um, do It's much more robust. It works uh, a lot easier. I'm not sure about D8 search. I'm sure that there's people in this room who are much better versed than that than I am or anyone else up here is. Um, but at the end of the day, Use use solar or use something else, lucerine something, 
to get that get that stuff out. The question was, what about views level caching, panels level caching? That's that's going to be covered in my part. Um, what uh, what Jason is talking about is the various back end technologies that we have as options. But we'll definitely be talking about some of those other internal to Drupal cache layers. Right. So the question was, is um, Google Appliance for the site, and then outside of Google Appliance, are using um, just regular search for the rest of the site? Um, what, is that killing performance? Um, it depends if you're trying what feature set you're trying to use. Generally, what we say is that search is not great in Drupal. Um, that's why Solar is out there. It's why other things are out there. Um, much like you wouldn't put all those documents in Google in Drupal search, you have a Google Appliance for that, right? So it's it's providing a certain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Would be using native search. Right. The, the only group. Same. It's the same concept, right? So you're outsourcing that search into something else. And the, that, the, the short answer. Is. The short answer is that yes, yeah, Solar is much more lightweight than the Drupal search engine and more accurate. If only because it's the the data storage model is a lot simpler. Uh, so kind of go just quickly through my SQL because I'm running out of time in the sections. I got to do the intro. So because I want to get your VMs booted up. So um, master master replication. If you're doing HA, um, there's something out there called Tungsten Replicator. I think it's Google has has that in their code repository. There's also a commercial product for that as well. Um, highly encourage you to look at that if you're trying to do master master in several sites. It is a pretty good product. Um, we've we've tried to use it a couple places and it's worked. Um, rewriting proxies. Stay away from them. Don't do it. Um, you will hate your life. Um, Trying to break reads and reads and writes out in MySQL in a proxy is just asking for death. Um, <laughs> just do master master. <laughs> it's much easier. Last question. Yeah. Are you able to change this presentation on the fly? Because maybe you could put next to that. Don't use it. Because when I yeah. come back and look at yeah, this, yeah. I'm probably not going to remember that. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. How about how about whenever I how about whenever I upload it, I'll change it for you. That's yeah, absolutely. And and hopefully this audio is going to be there too, so you'll be able to hear that because it is being recorded. So hopefully you'll be able to pull this back up. Um, delayed, re you know, slaves, slaves for MySQL if you're not doing master, master or delayed. So, you know, if you're doing something with comments or something like that, make sure you take that into consideration. Um, you can do reporting only slaves on your data. So break that stuff out. The, the important bit is to break stuff out so you, you can get those, those pieces separated. Um, again, there's so many things that we can, we can talk about here. You know, query cache turning off. I mean, I could go for hours on MySQL alone, which that's not why we're here. So. Getting the, the thing that I, we handed out to boot. So uh, install VirtualBox if you haven't already um, from the VirtualBox directory. Most of you probably have it installed from using other tools. Um, copy the Varnish 101 directory onto your desktop. If you don't do that and you try to run it off the USB or the DVD, you'll be an unhappy person. Um, make sure that you copy it somewhere onto your hard drive. Um, you will need two gigs of disk space, uh, ultimately four. Um, once you unzip it, um, it's not version three, it's just no version three in the end. Uh, unzip that file. Um, as we heard before, if you're on Linux, make sure you use the unzip command. Uh, open the CentOS 6.5 VBox file with uh, just double click on it if you're on a Mac. I think Windows, it does the same thing, or just right click on it and say open with VirtualBox. Um, the box will boot. Should take not very long to boot. Who all is at this point right now? Who has the VBox right running? About half of you. Okay, the other half of you, are you having issues? What's I'm sorry. What's that error again? Yep. Yep. Okay, they're actually in rich text format, unfortunately, because I put them on a Mac. That's my fault. So if you have an RTF viewer, <laughs> I know, damn Mac. You left them on the VM though too, right? I left them on the VM. They're so also the in the VM itself as well. On the in the whenever we get logged into it, there'll be a directory in there with all that stuff in there as well. Yeah. Not in rich text. And not in rich text format. So if you're on a Mac, it probably opens up fine, which I apologize for that. Yes. 
So if you get a VTX error is not available, that means you have virtualization turned off in your BIOS on your machine. So reboot if you wish to do this, or you can follow along with us. Um, go into your BIOS and turn on virtualization technology. Any other problems that people are having that don't that actually want to get it working? Okay, so try that. If you if you start VirtualBox first and then try to try to uh, double click on the file, and then you can import it from there as well. Yep. Oh, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. It's on the next slide. One. Okay, Dan. Dan, where are you at? Can you help her, please? Thank you. Uh, don't open the VDI. Open the VBox file. Oh, you don't want to extract it. Oh, really? Okay, get a different USB stick and copy off of that. That's probably a bad stick. Okay. Yeah, we hit this, like, um, some, some uncompression programs didn't like Mac zip for some reason. I don't know why, but any other? Yes. Yeah, it's it's four it's gig of data. It's four gig of data, so it'll take a little bit. It'll take probably it, it takes seven minutes to copy to that that USB because we did it about a hundred times, um, and, and that was only half the size. <laughs> so to unzip it, it, it'll probably take you know five minutes. I'm guessing. All right. All right. Cool. So I'm gonna kind of skip over this a little. Okay, so, so if you're on Linux and those text files are in the samples directory, um, just change the extension on it from text to RTF, and that'll fix it. Well, it'll allow you to open it as a different file type. It'll I get the right uh, file handler. My apologies for that. That's my my boo boo. So we kind of already went over this this speaking HTTP thing. Um, kind of already went to the fast CGI nginx thing. Um, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. So it, what we've found in the past, I mean, so for, I'm speaking as, as a black mesh person now. Um, we're doing about 1,200 servers, roughly, running Apache these days. Um, different people sites, different scales, different sizes, right? And some of the larger ones, you know, there's like eight or nine web heads using Apache. So we're pushing you know, eight, 9,000 concurrents sometimes uh, on these sites. So those those sites we found that um, the difference in performance between uh, nginx and, and Apache or I'm sorry between mod PHP and FPM um, due to the, that site right it's it's site dependent because it depends how many modules you have depends how many PHP um, uh, features you actually want to include inside of that stuff all that is dependent upon your stuff right so in a heavily uh, heavily module uh, site you just have lots of modules lot you need a lot of PHP functionality. FPM is probably the right is the right thing. In most cases, most sites don't need that. They don't need 100 or 200 modules enabled generally, right? It's whenever you're creating, creating platforms where you're trying to do multi-site for like 100 sites, and you want to have all those sites have all these different mod Drupal modules. That's whenever FPM can sometimes shine, right? Right. So the the answer was is the site he had had 125 modules. So anytime you're loading that much code into anything, any site call, you're going to consume some memory, right? And that's that's whenever that memory, and it depends what infrastructure you're running on as well. If you're running on, you know, DigitalOcean VMs that only have you know a gig of memory, then you know you're going to FPM is going to be the right choice. If you if you're doing, you know, if you have larger, fatter VMs that are you know eight gig, ten gig, twelve gig, sixteen gigs of memory, then mod PHP typically works. You know, it's within a five percent or ten percent range typically. Next. That's going to be you. Engine, uh, the question is, do you have any experience using Nginx cache over Varnish? You mean as a reverse proxy? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I tried it before I got on the Varnish train. Um, 
Nginx is just not as lightweight as Varnish. It is specifically Varnish is uh, is designed to be the fastest reverse proxy, whereas Nginx is designed to uh, be able to plug in and interoperate nicely with backends like FPM. Um, so there's definitely nothing wrong with using uh, Nginx as a reverse proxy to get a to get a, a speed increase like that. But the normal configuration that we use in Drupal is always varnish now at this point. It's been a long time since I've seen anyone do it with Nginx. Yes, yeah, you, you can, can also catch the, the fast CGI request. Yeah, yeah that's and that, completely and that, true. And that comes back to caching in layers, right? So you're, you're caching multiple things at different levels. So you can certainly do that, though. So kind of to this, exactly that same point, you know, we're talking about varnish today and memcache and things of that nature. So just tracking down what varnish is actually doing. You know, look at aging headers at this content, find out what the time to live is on it. You know, our cookies, you know, getting set, and, and that's what kills varnish at the end of the day, whether it's dynamic content, you know, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, basically, vickle, vickle, vickle is, is kind of the thing. So, anyway, it's enough slides. So you guys kind of got, got to, to this already. Um, so getting into it, this is the logins. So uh, on your Windows box or Mac or Linux, um, you know, open a window that you can have SSH abilities to. Um, SSH to your local host on port 2222. Um, there'll be a NAT rule that'll be set up. Uh, it'll be going back to that VM. Um, you can log in with root, and it's varnish 101. And it will be natted just to you. So um, just make sure you can actually get in. Raise your hand if you cannot. That is awesome. Hopefully you're all done typing. Wait, ra raise your hand if you can. If you can get into it? Awesome. Raise your hand if you're too busy typing to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Half the room, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're going to give you some time uh, to follow along and get into your own machine. Uh, has everybody seen and written down that SSH command that needs to? Because we're going to take we're going to take that time to switch up computers here and uh, start presenting the the next segment. Yeah, and the, the other thing, once you Great. get that up, open a web browser and hit those other two URLs as well. Um, just get those loaded. Um, yeah, and that I, way I you have them. So awesome. Campbell's going to have that too. So. They are not, but they will be. Yeah, they aren't. The online. slides are not online at the moment, but they will be online after the session. <laughs> Grumble of discontent. Yeah. Yeah. So the port, the the, so it's twenty two in front of everything. Right, so if you're used to dealing with Apache, it's 80, right? So 2280 is the is the uh, non-varnish version. 2288 is the varnish version in your web browser. So just localhost colon 2288, um, and then SSH is 2222. So if you're used to dealing with Amazon, you're used to dealing with off ports anyway. Um, just do dash p and then uh, lowercase p, not uh, dash cap p and scp, which is silly. Um, but lowercase p 2222, and it'll log you in. And if you raise your hand, if you have problems, um, Dan is here. I think Sean is here as well. Cool. So we'll be, and I'm going to come up and help you too. So I'll be back and running around as well. Your screen's wet and messed up up there. I was going to ask, what, what, is, what is it doing? I can't see. Uh, change it to 20. Is it the resolution? I'm sorry, is it the resolution? No, uh, Oh, okay, the projector got moved. Oh, it's not. It's not me. It's Dan. He ruined DrupalCon. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I'm trying 
showing. I'm just thinking of probably do I have to get into um, I have to get into the terminal screen. Uh, you have to switch. Well, no, it, it's, it does not um, display mirroring right now, right? All right, can you raise your hand if you're still having problems and not getting help? Okay, just a couple of people. So Yeah, sure. Why don't you go have a look and I'm going to I'm going to move on with this now. So What's in the box? So Again, just as Jason was saying, this is sent to us six. We tried to make it so you don't have to download anything because I don't trust conference Wi-Fi. Um, we have uh, about 16,000 nodes and I forget, uh, 50 users or so, all created with Devel. And uh, the username and password is admin admin for the Drupal site that is. Can everybody log into their Drupal site? On just uh, use twenty two eight zero, so not varnish. Again, port twenty two eighty is direct to Apache. Port twenty two eighty eight takes you through varnish. So someone is going to post that URL in the DrupalCon IRC channel. Good idea. Right. I uh, didn't hear a yes. Can we hear a yes from whoever's pasting that into? Uh, done. Great. So we also I also included in the Drupal install a lot of disabled Drupal modules. Some of them we're going to cover here today. Some of them are in case people get clever and start asking me questions about them so we can turn them on and play. Um, some of them are just in case you guys are may, way more brilliant than we give you credit for, and we have some really fun advanced stuff that we can do. Um, and some of them are for you to take home and play with. So first of all, when you load port 2280, you get directly to Apache, and we see that this is, this is extremely slow. Um, it's a large database. Uh, it's a reasonably complicated page that's going through pa through panels. If you want to see a really slow load, uh, go into that primary links menu and hit heavy. So that is a view that I, uh, I want to say it loads 600 nodes at once. Might be 6,000. Um, this is not an unrealistic case. Has anybody here has anybody else here ever had to deal with a page that had to load 6,000 nodes? Yeah, it does actually happen. Usually not in a river of news format like this, unless you really hate your users. <laughs> uh, but for example, I have one site that is a, uh, that is a, a uh, uh, from a budget watchdog group based out of New York, and it's not unusual for them to load, for example, a map of all the congressional districts in New York and they're loading three or four map layers, or five or six map layers, or 10 or 12, and each one has 630-something 630 something, uh, 630 data points on it. Not an unusual situation. So if you, if you go to 2288, the first time, of course, will be slow as it loads the cache. But even just in your browser, the second time when you hit reload, you're going to see a really big difference. It feels faster, right? So. We're going to do our first very simple uh, denial of service attack. Who here has participated in a denial of service attack against a completely legitimate and not illegal target just for practice purposes? <laughs> Excellent. The rest of you are going to have some fun. <laughs> right. So a denial of service attack is a very simple concept. We just flood a site with requests way more than it can handle until it goes down. 
Um, these requests can be as simple as a ping request, one of the simplest requests we could possibly make. They can be more complicated requests like we're going to do. We're actually just going to reload the front page uh, a ton of time it's, until it goes down. So we're, for this, we're going to be using the Apache Bench. So Apache Bench is a very simple benchmarking tool that comes with Apache. Um, there are more complex and more in-depth tools out there that I encourage you to explore. In this case, as Jason said, what we're really looking for are the big wins. We want to hang the low. We want to catch the low-hanging fruit, right? We're looking for. I'm not looking for an improvement on the scale of two percent. I'm looking for an improvement on the scale of two hundred percent. So, it's all right. A blunt object is perfectly fine. So. I'd like you guys to try running this command, ab minus c25 minus n100 http localhost. Um, don't do it against heavy yet, actually. I should change that on the slide. Uh, but so this is the way the ab command works. And you should understand this because we're going to use it a lot. And it's a very good way of telling when your own caching strategies are working or not. So ab. Um, I'm go yes, actually, so that's a very good point. So the question was, do we need to specify the port? So this command, typically you run AB on the host that is actually running your website. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. You do that because you're not interested in testing things like network latency. You really want to know how much, how much um, the actual web stack can deliver. So this is a command for you to run from the virtual box that you've got. So once you've SSH'd in, and as far as the virtual box is concerned, it thinks it's running on port 80. Uh, we, use, we use clever virtual box routing so that when you access it from your browser, you have to use a different port. It's a whole other discussion, though. So from that virtual box, we're going to run AB. Minus C is the concurrency. That is how many requests happen at the same time. Minus N is the total number of requests that you're going to hit. And then the target URL, where you're going to be aiming. Note that you have to have not just the base URL, but you have to have a path. So if you are hitting the front page, you have to have that trailing slash. So has everybody managed to run this with this uh, low concurrency and number? And nobody's computer has crashed yet. Yeah, we're clearly not doing this well enough. So now I want everybody to just play around with those numbers. That concurrency number is going to be a really important one, but definitely the total number as well. And uh, I have a little competition. I want to know who needs to have, who can get the highest numbers before it actually crashes. Just run against the home page for now. We, you can also run against heavy, but you're going to get a much lower number, and you're not going to win the competition. Sorry, I heard somebody say with number 2,000 or? Just under 2,000 And is that number or concurrency? That was a concurrency of 500. That was with a concurrency of 500. Can you put that slide back again? Sure. As far as uh, command arguments go, these ones are pretty semantic. Yeah, question? <laughs> That's fantastic. And you're doing it against, uh, sorry, the, the comment was that the benchmark fails, the run, out of, uh, run out of open connections before, uh, before the site fails. And you're doing it to port 80 from inside the virtual box? That is, that is fantastic. Actually, you know what? It might be because we have Drupal caching turned on. But still, what machine are you running? Um, MacBook Pro. MacBook Pro. Here is, uh, here is our advertisement for Apple. I have another question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could um, explain. The, so the number of requests, if, if you're using one request through Apache Bench, does that simulate a one uh, like user if you're going to try and use this for actual kind of benchmarking or is it like maybe 10 requests if your page itself loads a uh, number of assets? That's a very good question. It actually lo does a full page load. It's just as if one web browser hit your front page. So it grabs all the CSS, all of the image files, whatever you've got on there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, very good question. What is the forwarding port for Linux again? I copied some back and I don't even know the stack. 
Um, the forwarding port for which service? For SSH or? Uh, I don't know. I wanna, yeah, I SSH, uh, with so. Okay, so the SSH command you want is SSH minus lowercase p space 2222. Shouldn't be any different, but if but we can have one of these guys come and give you a hand with it. Black mesh guys, can one of you guys uh, give him a hand with his forwarding? All right. So we've gotten a sense of what our tools are here, and. The takeaway that I really want people to get from this, from this session here is not necessarily about an individual technology. Uh, well, Drupal, all right. But not, a, not necessarily about an individual caching technology as much as it is about having a, a, real, a really good mental model of how Drupal loads data and where you can stick caching systems in order to help with that. So this is a very simplified model of how Drupal loads uh, how Drupal builds a page. First, data is loaded from the database, and then we build objects, components that are going to go on to the uh, onto the page. They're rendered first as PHP arrays, and then they're rendered into HTML. And then we assemble the, the page in HTML. We end up with a full HTML page that we deliver to the client browser. This is the model that I want you to have in your hand in your head as we start as we start uh, dropping different caching mechanisms into it. So, for example, data is loaded from the database. We can actually put a caching layer in there so that a lot of your database queries come back from cache rather than hitting the relatively heavy MySQL or whatever your back end is. Um, you can cache the objects either the, or the, uh, the render arrays, either as render arrays or even as their full HTML. We can cache... The, the components that go to the page assembly, we can cache the HTML after the page is assembled. Um, in this model with the stamps all over it, we've gone from a four-step process to a one-step process. Uh, and the time improves accordingly. So the best practices set up for Drupal, and I use best practices in a loose way because there is a lot of discussion around this, but the most common setup that we have is what we're going to be working with here. Can I have somebody from the audience read the boss's voice, please? Just stand up and take the mic, or I'm going to start assigning it. Who wants to be Dilbert? <laughs> we have some voiceover talent, guys. So this is a cute little comic, right? But there is, there is some truth to this. Um, a best practice is what you do in a general case. It doesn't take the specific needs of an individual site into, an, into account. But a good best practice is something you can apply in 95% of cases. Part of a good best practices setup is to understand where you are going to be applying your tweaks and how, so that in that last 5% of cases, you still know where to look for your configurations, you know what sort of information you tend to change. Um, you can tweak and improve upon this best practice. There's definitely a lot of room for discussion around it, but the relative improvements tend to be on the scale of... Uh, you get a few milliseconds out of it. You'll get an extra 5%. Um, again, not on the scale that we're really looking for here. So the best practices set up that we're going to work with here is we have all of Drupal's regular internal caching enabled, which I believe it is already on the, on the uh, virtual box. We have APC configured with uh, 128 megs of shared memory. For those who have never tweaked their APC shared memory size, this is a very important one if you like to use APC. Uh, this is because APC does not do a great job when it has to clear its cache. It dumps absolutely everything. And if you are trying to put more into APC than it has space to store, it will actually slow down your site with all of the cache clears. It's a pretty fun prank if you have any sysadmins you don't like. 
<laughs> you leave your computer here. I've got physical access to it and all sorts of terrible things. Um, we have Memcache and Redis, as we mentioned before. I think Redis is actually installed there. We're not, we don't have the Drupal module uh, set up and enabled. Uh, there are some complications that can happen there. Uh, so we're going to stick with Memcache for now. And then we have Varnish in front of the whole thing. Is that a question in the back? That is an excellent comment. So to repeat that, APC will cache everything that you've got running so uh, in PHP. So if you have something like PHP MyAdmin running or any of the other many PHP-based administration tools, those are all going to be sitting in your APC cache as well. It's a very good comment. So first we're going to make sure that Drupal's core caching is enabled. Um, this is in, if anybody has never seen this before, then we are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> now that I've embarrassed you, has anybody never seen this before? <laughs> um, right, so out of the box, Drupal keeps its caches in the database, which is fine and better than loading and rebuilding everything from scratch, as we heard before, people with even a MacBook Air, that, uh, that database cache is fast enough that we can't benchmark fast enough to take it down. Um, the important things to note here, since we're going to be using an external caching system, you really have to make sure that there is a, uh, um, an expiration set. So cache pages for anonymous users is obviously a very important checkbox, but you have to set an expiration. Um, the minimum lifetime you don't necessarily need to set. If you really, if we get to do some of the really uh, badass fun stuff, we're going to start setting minimum lifetime to be the maximum possible value. And it's awesome. Good question. It doesn't matter what you set the expiration of cache pages to. No, not for our purposes here. Um, if you have no expiration set, what happens is that in the HTTP header, Drupal passes, uh, passes a cache control to, to Varnish and says, don't you dare cache this. And that's going to make the Varnish demonstration suck. <laughs> um, since we're going to be doing thousands of concurrent page requests at once, uh, it's all right if your lifetime is one minute. That's totally fine. Um, normally, you'd want this to be a nice long value. Good question. Yep. Let me do that one first, and then I'll have you ask the other one. So the qu I, you guys are my favorite audience we've done this for so far. I have to say, you're asking the right questions. So the question was, is this setup going to be specifically for sites that have a lot of anonymous traffic or sites that have a lot of authenticated user traffic? You're kind of giving away the punchline of my section. <laughs> Um, what we're doing first is going to be for, for sites that have a lot of anonymous traffic, since that is the most common case. For sites that have a lot of authenticated user traffic, uh, I am definitely equipped and really excited to show you guys how to do authenticated user caching as well. We will be using the same, we would be using the same toolkit, APC, Memcache, Varnish. Um, we would, we will have to go back and change these values again, but it's a more complicated question. Um, yeah, I'll answer that more up later. Second question. What about when you use tools like, say, Honeypot, that's going to be, it, it will have, uh, you can't catch, um, where it's protecting certain forms. Maybe I'm not, maybe it's not Honeypot, but there are certain modules that you enable that actually then disable the cache of all the pages where they're in. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is, a, this is another very good question, and you're jumping ahead, I think, four slides. But the, the question is, there are, certain, there are certain modules that you can enable that will disable caching for certain pages. 
Um, and is this going to override that I, is the implied question. And no, this does not override that. And in fact, it's very important that we disable caching for certain pages. There are some things that cannot be served cached to. Click that bit.ly link. It's a git um, gist file. It's kind of like a scratch pad. That way, if you guys can't read any of the functions I'm doing up there, um, meaning we'll be doing a, watching the varnish log, then you can just copy and paste it from there. I figure that will be easier if I make up a function on the fly. I can just add it there, and it will be easy for anyone to take it from there. Um, and that's it. So I'll leave this up while you guys download that. And if you guys could get those the files on the austintalk.zip onto your uh, VM, and then when we come back, we'll go through varnish. All right, Sound so good? we'll start at 2.30, uh, so that gives you about six minutes or so. That should yeah. be enough to get up and go if you need to. Pee like a racehorse, very fast. Mm -hmm. We've got stuff to go. Pee. I want to make sure we're not going to have time to do this. No, 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 thank you. That's perfect, actually. Because I don't get a little bit. You don't have to do this. Let's just confirm one thing. If you're using this garbage cache, the cache change is out. Oh, yeah. Cache change is not written to. That's exactly right. Well, it's, yes, that's the idea. It's going to be more You don't have to use cache pages. Oh, again, remember we talked about we want to cache in layers. So, for example, Varnish might have a relatively short TTL. Drupal has a lot of built-in behaviors for when to clear the clear cache page. And there is the Varnish module for Drupal, which means that Drupal will clear the Varnish cache for that page. But it's a totally valid configuration to not have the Drupal Varnish module have Drupal and Varnish, well, Drupal not really know that Varnish is there. In which case, you would use cache page. But yeah, I So, like the Austin Talk does it? Yes. So, there's a folder in there called Austin Talk and module. Yes, exactly. So, this one's going to override that one. It mostly would only work if you have a short TTL on Varnish or really specific pages that you're caching. And then what we can also do is one example that I would say, well, actually, we we did this for the front page, the varnish was cached on the front page, and, right. up anywhere, um, and, just, you know, and we didn't want to be only clearing it every time there, anything happened. Yeah, 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 no problem. We can also wrap that up. So maybe yeah. we'll put the yeah. link up um, yeah. in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. On the e-commerce site, you said it? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, the open open it's um, it works paper. fine for the first it's submission. Just, just and then the second submission, you get an error message that says, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's one of those that is best laid plans. Please refresh and try again. There's ways to come back. That's all now. You don't have to worry about it. And in hindsight, maybe we should have had a zip file that says, if you can't get it running back in your own local setup, here are the files you're working with. You should know where to put them. If you've already set up a local location, then you don't have to do that way. Yeah, there's a lot of second requests. Page is probably not actually being cached. Right. Drupal, so the rule is set that the header is not going to be cached. You're going to have a problem where you need to make some cache. You're going to have a white bar. And everybody goes sideways for 30 minutes. And it happens. So it ignores cache control. Yeah, yeah. So you know that it's cached. So, it'll, it'll, yeah. so each week, yeah. like Memcache will um, mem yeah. yeah. time out based upon what Drupal tells us. Mm -hmm. right? So there's going to be time yeah. out. And, like, and you'll still have the sure. six. The other thing you need to be very So, yeah, we'll, we'll put the files up. So, yeah, we'll put the files up. So, after the files up. And mine, you know, I'll be hashed page. Not just mostly the code, code, so I'll uh, be switching between the slides. So even if you don't have it running, you can at least follow the default yeah. and see what I'm doing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and everything else. Okay. That way, whenever you're busy, so interesting. Let's, let's, let's have a look. Yeah. 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 You're still getting the comments, getting injected, and stuff like that. You're still getting those comments. They're just not seeing. Yeah. 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 So one yeah. of the key things is the map. The barn is going to drop it out. It's going to go through. So you can get around that. You can show a user logging in to say, I want to put a comment. Yeah, those comments uh -huh. that become which is not really not and the internet version. is really great so you're always seeing your comment immediately so you don't have someone saying oh wait yeah. I'm going to yeah. go and I'll do it again I'll do it again I'll do it again, do it again. Mm -hmm. so you, you get away from that okay. so yes I, I would still recommend true, even true. if you have everything like 99% hit rate in, in bar 
generation. So you still put the other stuff in behind the sequence if you don't. Uh, and there's, there's ways to get whenever those yeah. things flush yeah. or you have a way of paying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like podcast right. too. Mm-hmm. And there's times you can't and there's times you can't schedule that, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the, way, the one direction. Yeah. 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 And, and if you had other things yeah. that are layers no. in there, mm-hmm. and another yeah. thing yeah. that yeah. is query um, yeah. 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 the same logic actually. Well, this is actually in my comp file. So in NC my comp. Yeah, it'll 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 serve it out. And let for cross for GSP. Oh, that's my secret file. Talk to me after. I love to have a little bit of time. I mean, you did. And we're going to turn this time at the end. We're going to general questions. I've been fighting. I've been fighting with that. There's some cases of all the kinds of stuff. Yeah, the hardware, the hardware layer, and then the application layer. Yeah, but I've got to talk to these guys first. But let's talk afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And it goes it goes to what we're yes. saying kind of overall. We have time. Time. Caching strategy mm-hmm. is like you know get to ninety five percent, and then we've got ways to get around the five percent. Right, like right, right. set up APCs right. just in the directory. You can do this, but you, you kind of need to step back and have a general yep. caching strategy first. So yeah. 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 it's not bike code. Right. Yeah. Case or yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's still a key store, but uh-huh. it's in bytecode, uh-huh. like a box. So it's compiling all the PHP into, into ones and zeros, and then running those larger zeros to the time when it happens, okay. and it flushes. Right? So the, the drawbacks of APC in a lot of scales, do you have an object that's too big to use? Yeah. So I'm going to write yeah. yeah. questions. Uh, yeah. So a lot of people are like, hey, there's an APC, I can always create it. What the hell's not? Large object, and okay, every time. So, so that's, that's, that's the first problem you have with the second. Wow. Um, Memcache is typically, yeah, we don't use um, Memcache as a random use for Bycast. So you're loading hundreds of thousands. So, yeah. 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 so yeah. 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 what you're enabled to do here, that's database information. It's not it's session information and stuff like that. We won't use APC to do these things, except for PHP Bycast, because we found that it just doesn't So the node hooks don't apply. Because you can't see it. It applies Memcache with Redis, and it builds her. Just having read us. Wow. The data gets updated. Um, yeah. Replication is a little easier in Redis compared to Memcache. So, like, so a little easier to set up. Okay. So, if you have a chase or something, should roll off the roll. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. So, yeah. the, uh, two ways. So, okay. we, uh, okay. on the yeah. economist on the right hand side, we kind of have the same thing. We, are you familiar with ESI? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm aware. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I had a feeling that was yeah. me too. So, we use a block on the right hand side that's most common. I feel like that was very similar. To what you're describing. Yeah. But we got this one yeah, thing true. Up very, very true. Yeah. So this is different. So our situation is different because we, we don't care yeah. even if as long as it rolls over every 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. If you need right. to get you get all the stuff lines, lines up, yeah. it works. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. If we do a time set, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So what you would do, yeah. So what you would do is yeah. run with the ESI and that would serve. So so the um so the way off cash, if we don't have to deal with it here today, then you should probably have to do it. I will totally sit down with you in a quarter of an hour. Okay, I'll call him five. Raise your hand right now. But the way off is I'll sit with you if you notice it. By making a separate request just for that token part. So you can actually pass the whole page in Varnish. And there's a JavaScript snippet that says hold up that that actually is like the way you can use the next page of the next page of the next page of the next And sometimes they don't understand this. They don't understand this. They don't understand this. gets just the form token and drops just the form token in, which is a huge improvement. So you as a dev is probably going to be very nice. Exactly because right. like this is the best now we're so and it actually, actually also up to has internal layers we saw that internal layers of you should probably look at it can't really do it as more exactly yeah so as a main block and then you as a business administrator that person you're gonna have to go into this stuff we always say if you have to log in for to do it it's your problem if you don't have to log in for it it's my problem DevOps is the same thing DevOps if it's in a form the big speed up would be they will be like okay I have this thing from my name the API you're probably figuring out if it's on a, on a page display, render cache is what you want because that's caching the rendered HTML. You can't just run ESI. Um, like you said, make sure the appropriate like, JavaScript okay, is there. Right, so memcache is being installed. I mean, this has to be started off with the So the default is fine. Yeah. But one of the cool things about our cache is that it's possible to have it rendered on a whole page without ever having a page of the HTML module. We have to switch multiple callbacks to come back to the rest and just pull in the information out of the cache. But I, given that way, way I'm expecting that we're not going to get over that, 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 but I really would love to do that. And these services are just sitting there. No, no, not at all. Those passes are so lightweight. Like, like, you know, this is 
actually pretty interesting stuff that might be relevant, but, uh, it's like, it's on but let's talk you, so we can get a box going. Okay. You look at uh, so that's uh, there's a basic all burnish all setup already in place, so, so, so that's, that's the stuff. The, the memcache stuff is a separate server. It is more advanced than that box. Solar sits off to the side, it does its own thing. You see people again. Sits off to the side, does its own thing. All you're doing is just calling into a version. Yeah. I mean, I would say if you use, again, we have a shell script in there that, you know, you can, it just puts a pause on the requirements and it depends on your budget. It depends on where you're buying your shirt So I just put up a site for United Way. This is a new startup script. I can put it here. This is a new AWS. VCL, and you can here, et cetera, So the question is, basically, in the best case, you can run MCAT and actually you can give it a lot of memory to work for. So you don't have to Where it's nothing gives you to spare a gigabyte or two gigs. Examiner.com so actually sets uh, almost so entirely memcache. There's two ways you have a huge cluster of memcache instances. So each has, I think, 32 gigs of memory. And, memory. and uh, like, that's that great. That's yeah. really fast. I have one. But you most servers can't run yeah. yeah. 32 yeah. gigs of memcache because you need it. So I do the same thing. Because then all the iPads will be talking about Yeah, maybe. In most cases, I don't need it. I give them basically one gig and I keep it on the same server. And you set a replication Redis, which is awesome. As the rest of the site. Yeah. Yeah, and Redis is, is uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a really cool thing. I highly recommend it. Much easier to use, better key store values. If they are really low balance and not round robin, um, it's lighter weight. Um, so it has a lot of things. Yeah, I, I would still keep it on one of the holes. I set something up like that actually last week. Because it's not, it's not particularly okay. CPU intensive, and if it gets CPU intensive, the load gets moved to the other one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, what's your name? My name is Okay. Just so yeah, yeah, uh, if you want to. It is. On the, the, uh, it is. Yeah. So I would keep it on I'll try one of the box if I don't have the yeah, other. Yeah, I don't know. I'll put it in both of the boxes. Yeah. I'll put it in the comments, and if I catch you, but that's I find out, then I'll tell you also. I'm just writing it down. So I'll put the routing. It's not an issue. But also, in theory, there are virtual boxes that are close together anyway. That's how we do it. That's the easy way. Yeah, yeah. So you get persistence. Yeah. Cool. Nice to talk to you, and, and really catch me after. And if and if you want, maybe we find a bot for it. Don't do that. Just treat treat them again. Treat them like cattle. Kill them. Kill them all, and just respawn. Modules. Uh, APC modules. Oh, APC. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a really good point, and probably worth making. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you ready? Ready. I'm gonna go home, so I can either sound there. Sure. Do you want me to go out and help people, or is that probably probably with my finger up my nose? Sure. sure. I'll, I'll go to the audience, okay. but you should start. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to get started again. So hopefully you took a couple minutes. First. Yep. I didn't get any water though. Put a hand up if you need help. Okay. Did everyone get the files downloaded? Okay, and on your VM. Okay. We'll be using those a little bit a little bit later. Um, so this is going to be uh, about Varnish, not uh, specifically uh, what Varnish is, but more just um, you know how to how to approach it and some caveats and some things uh, and some and some examples. So it should be pretty fun, uh, hands-on. So if you have any trouble with the examples that we're going to run through, just raise your hand. I'll be going through the examples locally here on my machine, um, so you can see them up on the board if you don't or screen board whatever it is. Uh, if you don't have it running. Yes? In less than 60 seconds, would you mind saying what varnish is? Uh, in less than 60 so, seconds? I well, I don't want to hijack your talk with something you didn't want to talk about. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what varnish is. Uh, Let's just say Varnish is a, is a caching server, and I'm going to go through. The, the opening slide is about hashing, and I, I think that will help answer your question. Because uh, it's hard to do it in 60 seconds, because then when I go through the other things, it'll seem like it's much bigger than that. Um, so yeah, we'll, if you still have that question in a few minutes, ask it again. You know. um, so the first thing uh, is RFC, RFMs, and TMI. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk about the strategy um, and how to approach Varnish. And I say strategy because you can read the, the manual and know how each function works, but if you don't have a strategy, a caching strategy, you're, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to just shoot yourself in the foot, maybe other developers and maybe users, but it's just not going to end well. Um, I don't know why this uh, exam is... Um, hovering over rapid prototyping, but that line is supposed to say it's not for rapid prototyping. It kind of goes back to you kind of need to have a, a, a big picture of your of your system, of, of how it works. Uh, get cozy with the RFCs. Uh, Varnish, you know, uses 
uh, the standards that have been built, and if you and it's not a tool in and of itself that does something. It, it uses the standards that are available from HTTP and the different uh, cache uh, headers. So if you you need to kind of understand those to know what's going on, um, and then you're not Rain Man. Comment your decisions. Um, I say decisions, and I use that word specifically because I, you know, you ever read a piece of code and it's got one line and it says this makes users do, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, and then it's like a very complicated logic, and you, you have to kind of read it like five times, understand it. Um, I say comment your decisions because you know you you really should put a code block there that really describes what's going on there. It should be easy to read. You should be able to understand it. You should be able to come back to it in about six to eight months because once you you know read through the RFCs and figure out what's going on, you have your strategy together. You know you're not going to remember eight months after that. You don't want to that. Oh, I remember when I read that you know item on paragraph C subsection four that it does X Y and Z and then try and recall that. So, you know, comment your decisions. Don't just make a, a comment uh, when, you, when you figure out something. And make it so you can sleep at night kind of goes back to, you know, keep it simple. Um, you know, comment, your, comment things out and make it just run really well. Don't make it overly complicated because it's complicated enough as it, as it is, as you'll see. Um, so moving on, um, when I talked before about knowing your system, um, caching is more of an art. Uh, it's it's not a science, as Cam mentioned earlier. You know, it's uh, each strategy is kind of going to be specific to your environment. Um, you can use best practices, but obviously, you know, it, your environment is going to be very specific, um, and that what strategies are not transferable means. And then I put a little. I would have used Chuck Norris, but I figure a Karate Kid would do just as good. Um, so the first thing we're going to go over is hashing. How many people are, are, are familiar with uh, the hashing function in Varnish? Okay. Um, so the hashing function in Varnish basically tells, Var and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to summarize this uh, in, in the name of time because I think when we get to the examples, it'll kind of make it uh, very concrete. So uh, hashing is basically what, it's, it's, it's starting at the end. Um, it, it's what Varnish uses to actually uniquely identify the items in cache. Uh, and we'll, when we go through the varnish log and we go through the examples, I think so, this will become very, very apparent. Um, some people don't really set the hash function. They use a default one. And some people also don't really understand how hashing works. So I have a little kind of example or kind of brain teaser up here. Um, so I have a page, and this page has a dropdown of 50 countries. Uh, this page also has a dropdown for a user to select three different colors, and this, this is an anonymous users. Uh, marketing wants to track an anonymous user selection throughout the site, so we're going to have, so we're going to set a cookie. The site has ten pages, and the questions, as you can see there, are how many different versions of the selection page are there, meaning the page with the form on it, and then how many different pages will be in cache in total. Uh, can anyone answer the first question? Anyone else? And we're we're hashing on cookies. You just select three different. Um, Cam, you have a guess. You can select three different colors, and you're going to set a different solution. Three. Huh. Wait, the site has ten pages. Yeah. Yeah. 150. Huh. 150. So you would actually have 150, and then you would act, and then you multiply that times the oh, ten pages, pages, and that's how many pages would be in total. So that's why we, the hashing function is important. Does everyone understand why it's 150? Okay. So I wish I had a whiteboard. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> The reason it's 150 is you have a drop-down that has 50 countries, right? And then you also have a drop-down that has three colors, and you're putting cookies. And so since Varnish hashes on cookie, when it sees the first page, if I select um, France and I select blue, then it's going to say, I have a page, and the variables are, let's, let's call the page slash colors. And then um, the three items it's caching on are uh, colors, and we actually we can negate that, but um, France and then blue. And then I have another one, France and then red. France and then black, and then I'm going to have you know United States and then red, United States and then blue, United States and then black. Do you guys follow? So it's actually 50 times three, and then if you carry those cookies across each of your page, and you're and then you're going to multiply it times the number of pages because Varnish is going to see each of those as unique. So that goes back to how hashing is how Varnish uniquely identifies a page to pull out a cache. So if your hashing function, if you don't understand your hashing function, and at the end of the day, how it's actually going to cache that page, then when you get up top, you know, when you start the, if you don't know what's going on at the end and you start to, at the top, you might think you're caching a page and at the end you're just 
caching everything. And then at the end of the day, you're just going to get a proxy. It's just going to be a very complicated Rube Goldberg machine that's only not really caching anything. It's not really a caching strategy. It's just saving pages and just basically saving all your pages and then rendering that, rendering them back out to the user. And you're not really using Varnish to its full potential. Does everyone understand this bit of, uh, of the talk? Any questions? Oh, great. All right, so next slide uh, is about uh, cookie control. Um, cookies are not your friend, as we just mentioned. Um, the best thing that you want to do when you with varnish or basically any kind of, I shouldn't say any caching strategy, is we want to get rid of them because if we have no cookies, we're just serving a basic page with no logic, a basically a static page. Um, so I say, you know, if you're not familiar with this function, this is a great function. The, um, meaning, like, when I see that, I'm like, oh, great. There's no logic involved. There's no cookies, because uh, most hashing functions usually hash on cookies. So that means it's going to go get the page, and then when people come back to that page, it's going to serve the same one. And I know, you know, it's going to be uh, a, a lot of hits, and, uh, and it's going to take load off my server. Um, so we want to get rid of them, and we want to use a whitelist. As, uh, does anyone, is everyone familiar with a cookie whitelist and cookie blacklist? Okay, so uh, I don't. Who has light lighting control? I, I, I'm just. I Was it who turned them yeah. off before? Yeah. Just want to, oh, that works. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Ah, oh, <laughs> Earth light burns me, me, my oh, developer great. skin. <laughs> <laughs> So a cookie blacklist, basically, it's just a blacklist. You know, you're saying, um, take these cookies out. So let's say you get a page and you've got 50 cookies and you say, take these five cookies out. Whitelist, like, it's just like an IP whitelist or IP blacklist. You know, whitelist just says, these are the only cookies that can get through. And that's basically a, a much more logical and safer method to, to handle um, your cookies and varnish. Um, a whitelist also. On the VCL. Yes, it's on the VCL. Um, and yeah, and we'll be going through it um, at, at, as a live demo in a second. Um, the, night, the other thing about a whitelist is if you work for a larger company, is that the whitelist forces you, uh, like we mentioned, to drop the noise because you can get a lot of cookies on there. If you've got some type of um, ad coming in, it might drop a cookie. You know, a marketing might come in and try and drop a pixel in. I like to call it pixel hell. Last and 10 to 15. Yeah, you know, Drupal's got like a lot of nice little pretty cookies. Um, and it also forces the business as a whole to work together. If you've got a cookie whitelist, and let's say a marketing department wants to drop you know, a, a new thing in from some other marketing company, um, it forces them to kind of say, like, we want it to work this way. And, and they, if they know that they can't just drop pixels onto the page without talking to the IT or tech department or developers, um, you know, then it kind of raises questions of do we need it? Um, you know, what's, what's it supposed to do? Um, and that way, it, it's, and also for performance, so you don't get like a lot of pixels or a, a lot of um, added cookies on the page. So it, it kind of forces everyone to kind of say like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I want to put this on the page, and if I want it to redirect on users who have X, Y, and Z. And so, okay, we have to allow that in, and then we'll we'll make it efficient instead of waking up one day. It's like, oh, there's a new cookie on the page, and then you have to kind of do a blacklist to pick that one out, and there'll be might be a new cookie, you know, every week. I mean, it, it's different. If you're working for a larger company, you probably experience that. Maybe for small, even for small. Shops, if you're doing something for a client, you know, they might drop a new something in, like, oh, we want this added, and then you'll have more cookies on the page. So um, a whitelist is a very good idea. So we're going to go through uh, the first example, which is uh, a voting with a whitelist and a hashing example. Um, so I'm going to switch over to, and I'm going to, and I'm Running this on my local because it's. I think it's going to be easier for me to kind of zoom in so you guys can kind of see see the code. Um, and I'm so I'm not running on my box, but you guys should have the same files. Um, so does everyone see that file in there called AustinVote.php? Yes, no, maybe so. Yeah. Okay. And also, you guys should have open. Um, that link with the GIS file that has uh, some helpful little uh, snippets we're going to be using. I'm sorry? I do. Are they not showing? It has to be mirroring. Uh, okay. Where is that mirror? Some preferences. Display. To do show all and arrangement. 
mirror. All right, can you guys see now? All righty. Is that too small, too big? Okay. It's very. Maximize the window. Yeah. It's gonna. It's wrapping wrong. Um. Let me do that in here. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we're there. Okay. So if you guys want to put that Austin-vote.php in your um, your dub 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 folder, so you can get to it, and then bring that up in a browser. Yes. Uh, varnish 101. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have an anonymous um, window open here. And is anyone having trouble getting to working with the page? No? Okay. So you can see I have no cookies um, right now, and then it's just a simple form. Um, and the other thing to note is that right now, actually, let me back up. Um, I, I know I saw a lot of hands about the, the, the Vickle file. Do you guys have the Vickle file open right now? Okay, so I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna go through the example on the assumption that everyone kind of knows the the Vickle file, and I won't go through how the varnish cast miss goes in there. But we'll be going into it. And I, I, I'm anyone who um, hasn't been into a Vickle file or done much with it, hopefully, will kind of pick it up. So um, I'm gonna refresh it again, and then you will see that it is a now it's a hit. So when you see this varnish cast hit, uh, that means it's being served from varnish, and we know that. And due to these lines right here, uh, this v if VCL delivery, if you're not familiar with it, it just means what do I do when I'm delivering the page? And we just say if you have a hit, meaning you found it in cache, then set hit. If you didn't find it in cache, then you set miss. So um, now that I'm in the Vickle file, I also kind of, like I talked about earlier, I like to start you know, at, the, at the end, uh, meaning the hashing function. And I don't know if you guys want to open your Vickle file um, if you don't, if you have the hashing function in there, do you guys have the hashing function in there? <laughs> Sorry, um, if you go to var in your virtual box, and, and uh, etc. Varnish, there's a default VCL in there. And then at the end of that, if you guys want to add from the gist file this hash function right here. And so let's go through the hash function. As I said, a lot of people like to cache on a cookie. So we say if the request has a cookie, then add that to the hash. And then we also say this is for later um, if it has an X device header. And this is for a later example. What we're going to do is we're going to make Varnish do the work of detecting if this is a mobile device or not and set that as a header instead of having Drupal uh, do that for us. Um, so that's kind of for the later, later example. So if there's no cookie or X device, is it going to hash it? Um, it's it, it's going to cache it, but it's not going to hash it. Yeah. So <laughs> does that make sense? No. Okay. So um, it, will, it will cache the page, but it will not add that to the variables of how to uniquely identify it. So our buckets right now are um, cookie and device. So if, if you think about it, you know, it's going to say um, this page right here. I have no cookies. If I get a page slash Austin slash or Austin dash vote dot PHP um, and there's no cookies and there's no um, X device header, then I'm going I'm to cache it as um, I'm going to catch it here, and the variable is going to be empty, empty. And then if I have a cookie that says blue, then it's going to say, okay, the variables are, you know, it's like a select from a database. Give me the page Austin vote where the cookie is blue. And then it's going to pull that one. Yes? The URL essentially is in the hash cookie. Yes. Mm -hmm. so you yeah. be adding cookie in addition to the URL. Yes. But you'll always have the URL. Yes. All right, and then does everyone have that added? The hash function. All right. So, um, and if you, if you have trouble with it, I'm just going to continue on. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, uh, meaning meaning I, I'm yeah. If you if you have a question, like raise your hand, and someone will try and help you. 
Um, but just with, for for time, um, I just kind of want to sure. make sure everyone sees the concepts and, and I can get through the, the examples. Um, yeah, that came out wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, it was recorded. Yeah. <laughs> for posterity. Yeah. Okay. So in the gist file, there is uh, at the bottom this uh, varnish log, and if you're not familiar with varnish log, it's basically um, varnish log. It tells you what um, is going on in varnish, and there's varnish. There's a comp not really complicated, but it basically uses a shared memory file and it reads from that. That's why you have to use varnish log to read the log file. So if you want to use this function and then open up a terminal, and then I'm going to yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show what's going on uh, in the log file. Yeah. All right, so I just, I just hit the page in my browser, and then this is what comes out from the varnish log. Um, I'm not going to go over everything that's happening right now. Um, but what I do want to go over is the hashing function. So you can see right here, and this will, we're going to look at this as we go through. So um, like we were saying, the URL is in the hash. So here's the two URLs. And then it just kind of goes and it's telling you this is, you know, uh, this is what I'm using to hash. And then you can see um, I restarted my varnish, so it, it's a miss. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... Blue, blue is my favorite color. I'm going to submit that one. So now my favorite color is blue. And you can see it's a miss. And you can see the hash has changed. The color is blue. And so these, this is the criteria that it's going to be using to cache this page. So the color is blue, and here is the URL. So that's, that's the when you're talking about is it going to hash and not cache. It's going to cache the page, but it might not always hash depending on the criteria that we're using to, to cache the page. And if I use this URL on another browser, you can see that in my net response, nope, that's a cache hit because it's just pulling the page that um, is in the cache already. And we can also do, and, and without even selecting, and as we said, it, it's using certain criteria to cache the page. I'm going to go ahead and add, create a cookie. And the, color, the name is going to be color. And the value is going to be blue. And then I'm going to refresh the page. And you'll see it's a hit. So because it's pulling from this page, since they're anonymous users, it knows that's the same page. So it's not going to do any PHP processing. It's just going to pull the page. So that's kind of the basics of the hashing function. Uh, any questions about that? Yes? Um, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because that will add extra headers. Yeah. Extra cat. So no, this is a this would be a basic page. So there's in, in the download zip there's a page called austin-vote.php because I, I just want to go through the basics without doing the complications that Drupal will um, add to to the caching layers. So for people who are still getting misses from Varnish, make sure that you've restarted Varnish since we updated the Vickle. Number two, make sure that you are logged out of the Drupal instance that's on this uh, on this virtual box. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your browser is going to send Drupal's cookies as well. Mm -hmm. And there is no number three. Service varnish restart. Yes, service varnish restart. Well, uh, you don't need to sudo; you already root. Yeah, service mm -hmm. varnish restart. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so. That's kind of the first example I wanted to get through is uh, basically the hash. The, the 
the kind of general strategy, um, and we can talk more about that, um, kind of running short on time, and how the hashing function works. So I'm going to switch back. Actually, um, I'm, I kind of want to go to the next example, so I'm just going to talk through it. I don't need my slides for it. Um, so the next slide just kind of says, you know, and these slides will be up on, on the on the, um, the talk page. Bless you. Um, so, you know, the, now the next question is, you know, that's it. You know, is that all it can do? And um, it, it can do a lot more. Uh, how many people have to deal with detecting mobile browsers? Okay, and what do you guys generally use for that? CSS? JavaScript? And Nginx, we not that. Do you do do in Varnish? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, with, with Varnish, one thing, there's, there's a lot you can do, but um, mo ways to move things into Varnish will help you on the back end. Or even you don't have to do that kind of detection, whether it's uh, we're going to do an example for mobile detection, but you can do uh, country location, you know, figuring out where in the country they are, uh, and address and, and, and whatnot, all in Varnish before you even hit the back end. So that way you're dealing with a page, or you can cache that page uh, without having to process it on your back end. And Varnish is going to be much faster at it because it's you know, written in C and it's just made to be very lightweight and very quick. Um, so with the mobile, and this is with the mobile example, what we're going to do is we use a library called Mobile Detect. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are um, familiar with it, but Mobile Detect is it's, um, maintained by Browser Stack. And within uh, the zip file, you'll see this mobiledetect.php. And as we mentioned, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a big file. Um, it's just a bunch of regexes. And regexes are something that uh, Varnish loves to do. It's basically when you're manipulating cookies and whatnot, you're always doing regexes. So to get clever with it, uh, there is a module in there called austintalk.trust.inc. And basically what it does, and we're running short on time, so if I'm going too fast, um, I can talk about this offline. But just the strategy of it is that instead of having to go to the back end and, uh, or having JavaScript do it, but have, going to the back end and doing a bunch of database lookups, or if you're using uh, Browser Cap, uh, it, it also, uh, Browser Cap does database and Mobile Detect does a regex. Um, we can have um, Varnish do it, and what we do is this function basically just builds a regex, and then it builds a vickle include file. And we can see it's a submodule. Um, and what it does is it basically takes the user agent that, that Varnish provides us, and it basically does a regex based upon the mobile devices that mobile detect would already use. And then it sets this device header called mobile phone. So to see that in action, once you run the drush command, you'll get this file. And then if you want to use the file, then you would add it inside of your Vickle. Or sorry, you would add it to the same folder as your Vickle, and then you would do an include. And on the gist file, you'll see this line right here. So if you open your, your Vickle, here. And at the top, uh, your pass will be different, but you'll see this include. And you want to include wherever you put this mobile detect.vcl. And then if you scroll down or you know page down in your vehicle file, um, somewhere above, I like to do mine around the cookies, um, you'll want to call the function, which is mobile detect. And this is going to do the regex for our mobile detection. So, so what we've done is we've created a, a file that will do our mobile detection for us and varnish. So I'm going to open Safari, and I've already got, and I use the developer tools to set my user agent to uh, iPhone. I'm already on iPhone. And if you notice, inside of austinvote.php, we look for that header and we say, if there is an X device header, which would come from varnish, then say this is mobile. That way we know, the pay we know this is a mobile, um, mobile device. So a few interesting things are going to happen here. So you want to add that file, and then we need to restart Varnish. So I'm going to go ahead and restart mine. All 
All right, so my varnish is restarted. Included, and we call ah, it's not on iPhone. So now I'm on iPhone, and you'll see it says mobile. And then further, if we look at our uh, varnish log, actually, I want to restart it so we can see see that from the beginning. So it's a miss which is fine because we restarted, but we talked about that hash function and knowing what your hash function is doing. You'll see we added this device header that I said would be used later, and it's also, you can see it being used here in the hash function. Um, it's using the mobile phone header that we, uh, device header that we set, um, the URL, obviously, and then there's no cookies yet. And so this kind of goes back to that conversation uh, about, you know, we have a drop down of 50 countries and we have three options and how many different pages there will be. So if I select blue, I like blue on mobile phone, but more importantly, in my hash function, I'm now the color blue mobile phone, you know, and the, and the, uh, the URLs. And if I select red, same thing. So you can see the combination that's happening <clears throat> as, as we grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, yes. And we're just actually about out of time. Um, Probably won't have time to get to the other things, but do we have any questions so far? Um, the dress command? The dress command is going to be at dash talk, I believe. at dash mobile dash VCL. And it's in that downloaded zip file, This all, all the code here. Yeah, so if you open up that, it's all there. And uh, it should be said before we do questions, we are all around the conference and really happy to sit down with you in the sprint room or at the Black mm -hmm. Mesh booth or at the Forum One booth or wherever to go through your own individual issues. Yeah. And uh, one more thing is I looked on the on DrupalCon's uh, website. They actually have a Drupal Association YouTube channel. Um, this session with these slides and everything that went through these laptops will be on a YouTube uh, video. Um, it says it basically puts it up a few hours after this, so it should be available by the end of today. So if you just find the Drupal Association's YouTube channel, you'll get all these <laughs> slides as well as having us talking to them. Yeah, so. and we're trying to upload the, the PowerPoints and the, the uh, zip file. It's just very slow on conference internet. Yeah. No, and that was uh, exactly. So, and that yeah, that was the other part talking about offloading it is that um, I was going to talk about as devices change, they're always changing. That you can just mo you can do run this drush command <clears throat> and then just do a varnish load by recompiling. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, while running without having to shut down your servers and restart. And like when you're getting you know a million pages a day, it's kind of important that you don't want to have any downtime. Um, in the far corner over there. Okay, yes. So the question is, can you um, hash just on certain cookies? <clears throat> and the follow-up question to that one is, can you hash in different things? Maybe you want to hash in a different URL. Uh, the answer to both of those is yes. Uh, in the Vickle, you'll kind of see in the, in the whitelist the uh, sub all, and there's also another regular expression where you can modify the cookie headers. And I, I, was, I wanted to get through the whitelist, but basically this is what it does. You, I could send 50 cookies at it, and it would filter them all out except for these two that I've allowed through, is the color one and the Drupal visitor color. Um, and as far as the URLs, um, yes, uh, you can also manipulate the the, um, the URL, and that's good for things like if you want all pages to be saved as www.example.com and someone comes to your site as example.com, you can manipulate it and say add www if it's not there, so you can kind of normalize that. So yes, on both. 
I've got a question about uh, a website that has uh, maybe a feed of some sort on it mm -hmm. that is somewhat more dynamic, but it's still anonymous. Mm -hmm. Are there solutions for still using varnish, not using cookies and stuff like that, and, and not using like JavaScript to reload that little section of the DOM? Or what are, can you discuss? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, so, was that clear enough of a question? It was. Because it seems very clear to me. <laughs> So there are, there are a few options. If it is a static file, the normal behavior that, that you write into your Vickle file uh, is for Varnish to pass through, which means to just directly pipe from the back end, um, which is uh, as direct as you're going to get coming out of the file system. But a, generated, mm -hmm. but a generated feed, like we tend to use in Drupal, um, you, can, you can set the uh, cacheable lifetime based on really whatever you want out of the headers, including things like the like the file extension or the specific URL. So you could say, yeah, this has a this has a lifetime of five minutes, a nice short lifetime, which will save your server a ton of load if it's actually being hit. It sounds like you also want to use an ESI. Are you familiar with ESIs? So I didn't get get to those, but um, yeah, if if you, if I understand your question correctly, you have the home page and you have a little widget that. Um, needs to be updated, then probably oh, using that kind of feed. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 if I'm understanding correctly, you could use an ESI and have it such that when that ESI is served, it has a, a its own cache headers of, of when it should time out and whatnot. All right, guys, we really are out of we really are out of time. We have to let the next session come in here. Please do come and approach us in the hall at the booths at the sprint room. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>